Coming up, I finally get a low profile keyboard. Play some games. Jeff continues with the next. I chat to Alan and end with a type in. Let's get on then. I have covered many keyboards on the show, so I'll skip all that stuff and jump straight to this one, the low profile. The keyboard started to appear in adverts from advanced memory systems around mid-1984, selling for $49.95. Quite a lot of money considering the 48k machine was selling for $175 at that time. I got one of these in 1985 by accident, after sticking the key labels on my DKtronics keyboard the wrong way around. I took it back to the shop and they gave me one of these instead. But it was brilliant, and it lasted a long time too, and I was sad when I had to let it go when I sold all my stuff. Since then I've always wanted another one, but it wasn't until January 2020 that one came my way. I unwrapped it carefully and gazed at the beauty of the thing. Yes, it was a bit dirty, and yes, it needed cleaning, and yes, some of the keys were yellow. But it didn't matter. I had finally got my low profile back. A quick test showed the spectrum inside was faulty, so I had to strip it all down and send it off for repair. The lower part of the spectrum case fits underneath, which was easy to remove. Once the motherboard was back, and I'd moved house, it was about July 2020 when it was time to put it all back together again. And then this happened. To say I was upset would be an understatement. Undeterred though, I bought some cable strippers, stripped the cables, and re-soldered them all back on, in hope that it might work. It took quite a while, but then it was time to test it. Some keys didn't work. Again, I was a bit disappointed, but it was that pesky ribbon cable again. One of those joints had come loose. So a quick flash over with the soldering iron and it fixed it. Another test and yes, I mean, a few keys had problems, mainly down to lack of use, but after a good few typing sessions, they were fine. And that was it. I had it back. So what is it like? The case is quite heavy, more so than the DKtronics variant but not as heavy as the metal transform beast. As the name suggests, it's low, but compared to the DKtronics and transform, it isn't particularly ultra low, it's just a bit smaller. It's made of black ABS plastic and has 53 full travel hard plastic keys, including a separate number pad. The legends are printed directly onto the keycaps rather than using stickers like some other manufacturers, and they look really professional. The angle is good to type on though, and the keys give a nice response and click. They don't travel as far as the DK version, but it's still a nice action and very satisfying to use. The spacebar is excellent when word processing and feels really nice. When I initially got it, I gave it a good clean, but I didn't do any retro writing on the keys. I don't mind them looking like this, it gives it a bit of character in my opinion, and I'm happy to use it anyway. Playing games was good, but as you can appreciate, it wasn't really designed for that, but it worked well enough, just like it always did for me back in the day. Attic Attack was fine, Manic Miner, The Hobbit, you know the drill by now. Playing games with a real keyboard provides a much nicer and more positive response, and I loved mine back in the day, and it was great to finally use one again. It feels really nice, and there are so many happy memories associated with this keyboard. And it even appears in one of my diaries when I happen to hit the space bar a little bit too hard, and I ended up stripping it down and fixing it myself. It seems from what I can see, there were four versions of this keyboard. First, this is mine from back in the day. Apologies for the messy room. Notice the single logo on the case, and no extra lines across the top. Then there's this one. This picture is from Spectrum Computing. Now I think this one has had some homemade modifications, in particular the rainbow stripes. The red lines across the top though are original. And here is my current version that you've already seen, which has the red lines across the top and red diagonal lines, but obviously no rainbow. And the final version arrived after advanced memory systems went bankrupt. The keyboard was picked up by Saga, and they offered a really groovy looking white version in early 1987. Now that does look cool. I wonder if they ever made any though, as it does look like an artist's impression or just a recolored original. 
Around the same time, the original black version of the keyboard was offered by Video Vault for just £28.50. Now, if you could buy one of them today, I'd be the first in the queue. This is a great keyboard, and I know a lot of people like it. And it almost completes my keyboard collection. When I had this keyboard, I would play endless arcade games and quite a few adventures too. So let's check out a game I was playing back then. This is Chucky Egg by ANF Software, released in 1983. Chucky Egg is a classic Spectrum platformer, and like all good games, the idea is simple. You play Henhouse Harry, and your job is to collect all the eggs. Simple you might think, but this game has a great learning curve, and eases you gently in at the start. Each screen has to be negotiated individually before you can move on, and all of the eggs have to be collected, along with any food for extra points. Harry can jump and climb ladders, and with this simple mechanic our hero must grab those eggs to get onto the next screen. The hen house though has some residents, chickens, although they do look like ostriches to me. These prowl around randomly and have to be avoided. Luckily there are plenty of alternative routes to take, and it shouldn't take you too long before you can complete this first screen. The next screen is pretty much the same, but introduces a hole in the floor, through which Harry can fall to his death. The layout is different too, but again this shouldn't prove too tricky. The third screen, and we get lifts. Now these can be very tricky to get onto, until you learn the right place to stand and jump. All of these levels so far have a large duck in a cage on the top left. Eventually this will be released, but that's on a later level, a level I can never get to sadly. The graphics are well drawn and move smoothly, accompanied by just the right sound effects. There are a few in-game tunes too, and most of you should recognise the birdie song at the start. The game is very addictive, you just want to get further into the game and see the different layouts. It's easy to play and difficult to master. I think the best I can manage is about level 4 or 5. Because I can't get to the level where the duck is released, I watch the RZX playback and here it is. It's on level 9. Out comes the duck and chases you around. The level layout is the same as level 1, so if you can get this far, you should be familiar with it. The game overall is, as I said at the start, a true classic. Great fun to play and very addictive. Brilliant. And now onto a game that I never played back in the day. This is Big Ben Strikes Again from Arctic Computing in 1985. Ben, the famous reporter, is trying to piece together things for a huge news story that's about to break. And to do this, he has to gather gifts and give them to politicians so that they reveal some of the story. The game is, as many would agree, a Jet Set Willy style game. And there are platforms, ladders, conveyor belts and the like. Unlike the famous Matthew Smith game though, there are doors, and these doors lead to other screens, but it's a bit of a chore to use them. If you walk left into a doorway, and then try to walk right when you get to the other room, you'll be sent back to the first room. What you have to do is continue walking in the same direction, or jump back in the direction you want to go, which is a bit tricky. Spotting these gifts is easy, however, deciding which gift to give to which politician is a choice you'll have to make for yourself, and eventually work out with trial and error who wants what. The graphics are nice and well drawn, but sometimes flicker. Some of the politicians are easily recognised too, however, I'm not sure about that policeman sprite. Yeah, we'll leave that there then.
There are 20 rooms to explore and navigate, some easier than others, and there's the usual dangers such as trapdoors, narrow ledges and a variety of things to kill you. The collision detection is a bit dodgy in some cases too, so be careful, otherwise this will become very frustrating. The main sprite I always thought looked like was on a unicycle, but maybe that's just me. Sound is okay, but if you turn the music off, which does get very annoying after a while, the only sound you'll get is when you collect a gift, so there's no walking or jumping. Control is good, but some of these ledges are tricky to get onto, and the problems with the doorways, as mentioned before, can make it annoying. If you get bored of the game, it does come with a screen editor, so you can redesign every room in the game. It's fairly easy to use, and you can save out your masterpiece. But you can't give it to your friends. You have to have the program to load it in if you want to play it again. To be honest, I would stay clear of this unless you like hard, frustrating platform games with a hint of Jet Set Willy. This is Roger the Pangolin, I think that's how you pronounce it, released in 2020 by Ionian Games. When I first played this it reminded me of Bounder by Gremlin, and I couldn't play that game either. It does look superb though. You control Roger on this 3D interstellar highway, at least that's what I think it is, I couldn't find any instructions. You can move left and right and use the boost key to speed up. Each course is timed and involves hitting or missing certain colours. For example, the green blocks will slow you down, and the white blocks will cause you to jump. Using these you have to get to the end of the course before the time runs out. The game looks brilliant, and gameplay is addictive, but can sometimes be a little frustrating when you miss completing a level by just a few seconds. Once you know the tracks though, you can memorise which is the best route to take. Sound is a bit limited but works well for the game, although it would have been nice to have some music. A great little game then. Especially if you're good at Bounder. And I wanted to see what people what people would do with it. You know, is this a bit of a change? I mean, as 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 we all know, I mean AGD has been great for the homebrew scene but um there's a there's a there's a, there is a point where the games start to be a little bit samey don't they so yeah i, I was going to get onto that but I'm, I'm, from what you were saying just previously there are, you and i could probably go on onto agd and knock out a platform game in in a week or so and it'd be like every other platform game that agd has done it it's um it's how people interpret the use of it so i, I was asked once how i come up with ideas and i said Take take a block, take the uh, the deadly block for example, you don't have to use that to be killed, you could use that to change direction, you could use that to change colour or to change a weapon, you could use it as, you could use it for anything, it's how you interpret that item. Well that's, I mean th this is going into another area here, but one of the other things that I, I'd like to try and help people to do is stretch their imagination a little bit and make games that aren't the same as as other ones that, that already exist you know um <laughs> this from someone that's mostly written clones of arcade games i know but um nevertheless I'd, I'd like to see that because a lot of people would love to make their own spectrum game i know that that that's a, a sort of bucket list item isn't it for for a lot of people you know oh, i'd like to make a game and publish it that's what i wanted to do when i was a kid and so on but you know, if you're going to do that, then don't just do, don't just, don't just tick that box. I mean, make something that that's, that that uh, that you can be really proud of. You know, that that's that's a message I'd like to put across to people. You know, take the time and think of put some original ideas in there, because you're 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 kind of helping the community then, and you're giving something back to uh, to something that's uh, probably 
given you a lot of uh, fun over the years, you know. So, so where is AGDX Mini going then? What have you got any plans for it? Or is- well, I'm working on a lot of additions for AGDX Plus, which is like a, a, a new engine for for AGDX, which is which has a lot of new features, and a lot of the features that are in that will also be in AGDX Mini because they have a common source code now. Some of them need to be adapted, but essentially, AGDX Mini is has merged into the regular AGDX now, so it's an option when you when you choose the engine, you can choose to have eight by eight or sixteen by sixteen. And, and what what sort of feedback have you had from AGDX Mini? Um, I know there's been a few games uh, released by it. Have you have you had any constructive criticism or any any good ideas been given? Well, you know, it's um, it's nice. I mean, there's obviously there's not nearly as many games as there are with um, with AG, with regular AGD. But you know, there's a couple of authors that that really enjoy it, and that's nice to see. You know, they really like working with the little sprites. There's a, there's a guy called uh, Gabriele Amore who's made who makes a, a certain style of game. He made the game called uh, I think it's Manic Pengo or something like that. I don't know if you've seen that. That's quite a new game. And there's there's another guy called John Davis who's a big fan of it as well. He's made a couple of uh, couple of nice games as well. So yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it, it's I suppose it's a little bit of a novelty, but for me it was a fun thing to to make. I mean, yeah, the, the the games do look different from normal AGD because of the size of the graphics, and uh, they they've got a sort of look and feel of their own. Particularly when when you, as a Spectrum user, you're used to that size graphics moving in character squares, and all of a sudden you've got smooth movement. It's and it gives them a, a totally unique look. I think. Well, I'd just like to thank you for creating it and having the you know the the idea of putting that together because I certainly enjoyed working in the smaller sprites with the smaller sprites. Well, just just the fact that you've made a game is thanks enough for me. You know, it's great to, to, to see people doing doing that because the reason I do it really is is to sort of put something back and encourage people to to get creative and have fun. You know? This is Digger Dan from Ocean Software, released in 1983. There's very little story, and this is a version of the arcade game Space Panic. And in fact, the instructions make a sneaky mention to this. The line reads, Keep calm and above all, don't panic. Or maybe it was a nod towards Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, broadcast on radio in 1978. Anyway, the game plays just like the arcade version. You have to dodge the monsters, dig holes, and trap them, and then hit them with your spade to kill them. The graphics are fairly smooth, but the monsters seem to move randomly, which can be a real problem. You have an oxygen limit per level, but a new supply will appear at the top of the screen if it gets low, and you have to get to it before the monsters get you. Sound is used sparingly with the same sound effect, prominent for everything, but that's okay, it suits the game. Gameplay is a little frustrating because of the random movement, but in general, this is one of the better versions of the game, for the 16K machine. If you like panic style games, give this one a try. Hello, and today we're going to look at two games for the Spectrum Next. The first of these is 4K Race Next. 4K Race Next is an update of 4K Race Refueled with graphics updated for the Spectrum Next. The original 4K Race was submitted for the 2004 minigame competition in the 8-bit category and was written by Paolo Ferraris with graphics by Luciano Costarelli and the engine sound idea came from Mario Chrome Parato. This is an absolutely cracking little game and it's free as well. If you go to the software section of the Spectrum Next website you can find a link for a free download. It's very simple and reminds me of some early races such as Pole Position. 
You have seven sections of track to race along and when you reach the end of those you've completed the game. The road or racetrack that you race down twists and turns, I think randomly from what it says in the manual. And in your way are various cars. In fact, you can almost always see a car in front of you all of the time. When you pass one, another one soon arrives. And these other cars that you need to pass are your main hindrance in the game. And that's pretty much it. The game moves along at an absolutely cracking pace and looks really, really good. The updated graphics for the Spectrum Next are really colourful and well drawn. The engine sound sounds really good, so well done to Mario for that one. And the fact that the original game was only 4K, obviously it's bigger now with the Spectrum Next graphics in it, is testament to the superb coding skills of Paolo. Every time you complete a section of track you're given an additional amount of time. It's the usual, you have to complete a section of track in a given time and then you're given additional time when you pass it. This game isn't overly challenging. I think I completed it on about my 10th or 12th go. So it isn't a long-lasting challenge, but it's certainly worth picking up and playing if you're looking for something to play on your next. And given that it's free, you can't really be ripped off. If I was going to level the criticism of this game, I would say that the collision detection sometimes seems a little off. And the only other thing I can think to criticise it on is that it doesn't work, or I can't get it working on C-Spec. Having said that, I love playing games on my next anyway. So it gives me something to go to when I boot my next up. So that's 4K Race, a cracking little game. Next, I'm going to look at a game called Sweeper, by some guy called Jeff Neal. Yep, that's right, I wrote this game for the next. The reason I wanted to feature this game in this section is to give an example of what can be done in Z80 once you've completed the tutorials that I mentioned in the last show. So this game is a clone of the classic Minesweeper Windows game that used to come free with various versions of Windows back in the 90s or early 2000s, I think. And as I say, I really did this as a tutorial. So the border uses the tile map of the next, as does the playing area once you start the game. The main screen uses the layer 2, and the game over screen also uses a layer 2 image with transparency on it as well. To be able to fit all those big layer 2 images into my next, I had to learn how to do bank switching. The other thing that this helped me learn was how the AY sound chips work on the Spectrum Next, although I only ever used three channels, I didn't go to the full nine channels that are available on the Next. The other main thing that I learned while I was doing this is how to get control input. So you can use the mouse, you can use keys, or you can use a Kempson joystick. Preferably a Kempson joystick, something like a Mega Drive gamepad that has more than one button on it. Because you need two buttons for the game. I'm not going to comment on the game itself, a bit like Paul in the last episode where he didn't want to say how good or bad his game was. There are four difficulty levels, easy, medium, hard and insane. And insane is really, really difficult. I've never managed to complete it on insane. I have on hard once or twice, but that's quite a challenge too. Unlike the original game, you can't change the playing area size. But apart from that, it's pretty much the same as the original game. The hardest thing to do, and this wasn't something that I learned from any of the tutorials, was a flood fill. So when you click an empty square, it'll fill all the surrounding empty squares. Tip for anyone wanting to do that, you need a recursive function that calls itself. So there you go, that's Sweeper for the Spectrum Next, a great example of what you can do if you follow the tutorials that I mentioned in the last episode. Until next time, happy gaming! Here we are back in Typing Corner. This time we're going to take a look at this game, Funfair by Jack Knight that was in Popular Computing Weekly on the 23rd of June 1983. The listing was only one page long and printed in large fonts, so it was quite quick to type in. However, there were a few issues. First of all, I got an out-of-data error, so I had to double-check all those data statements. Then the wall that moves after so many balls was wrong, and also the high score and scores were printed wrong as well. And finally, the screen didn't clear at the end of the game, but that needs a code change rather than a code correction. Well then, here it is.
you control a clown head that might look very familiar to UK viewers, but this is how it was in the magazine. Randomly, a ball would be blown out from the launcher on the left, and you have to try and catch it in the clown's mouth. However, the ball sometimes drifts toward the end, which makes it very annoying, especially as the key response isn't all that good. After a set number of balls, the walls will move in, so the reaction time becomes less. Anyway, this is probably the first time it's been seen since it was published in the magazine, and it will be available to download from my website shortly. Now here's a little extra bit. Back in March 2020, I was contacted by a lady who had watched the show and who had also recently revived her 1 to 8K machine along with her micro drives. She works in the television industry and did so when she had a Spectrum and, like many of us, she wrote her own programs, including a nice tool that replicates the countdown ident seen on many TV channels, or at least used to be seen on TV channels. Now we rarely see them, unless of course we work in a TV studio. She sent me a copy of this and I found it fascinating. Here is a program very few people actually saw. Sadly, it was never used in the studio, but it does a great job of making the real thing. You can add text and change the colour, and it all works really well. This sort of thing I find interesting. It's a glimpse of what other people did with their machines, other than games. If anyone is interested in seeing this program, I will make it available on my website to download shortly. <laughs> 